Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, this is our second lecture of the semester being hosted by the Department of Visual and Critical Studies. Uh, tonight, we're very, very honored to have Mohammed Gohar as our speaker, uh, a remarkable man uh, who has led a remarkable life. And I encourage you all, uh, when you get home tonight or tomorrow, to please Google him, and because I think that this evening will only scrape the surface of what he's about. Uh, I'm going to read uh, a little bit about Gohar's history, and then we'll start our evening. Mohammed Gohar was born in 1947 in Cairo, Egypt, and is a graduate of the Applied Arts College of Cairo, where he studied photography and cinematography. In 1973, Gohar volunteered to be a cameraman during the war between Egypt and Israel. His subsequent position in the media office of President Anwar el-Sadat led Gohar to establish Video Cairo, which later formed a partnership with Reuters. He has worked closely with American contemporaries such as John Chancellor, Peter Jennings, and Barbara Walters. Between 1973 and 1992, Gohar covered major conflicts in the Middle East and Africa, as well as in Bosnia and Northern Ireland. Over the years, he has produced news and entertainment programs throughout the world and created public, private, and satellite TV channels. In late January of 2011, and right before Egyptian President Hosni Murabak stepped down, Gohar launched 25 TV, a satellite television network that aired directly from Tahrir Square. 25 TV provided journalistic training for young people, young people uh, like yourselves, uh, and supported the goals of the revolution, like yourselves, <laughs> calling for constructive dialogue, positive change, and support of civilian rights and responsibilities. Uh, before Gohar uh, takes over, I'm going to present a short video about him as a continuation of the introduction. I would also like to let everyone know that uh, tonight, uh, time permitting, we will present the first in a series of Egyptian movies that SVA plans on showing over the course of this and hopefully next semester. Uh, tonight's movie called uh, The Year of Counting, uh, The Night, of, excuse me, of Counting the Years uh, is an incredible movie that premiered in 1969. It played in New York and is considered to be the great classic of Egyptian cinema, uh, if not one of the great classic movies of uh, cinema period. And so uh, after the talk, for whoever would like to stay, we will air the movie and there will be postings about uh, subsequent screenings uh, that will be up around school. The classic way of doing the news and TV is no longer should stay because people make their own media. Social media is people's media, uh, citizen media. It's about everyone carrying a phone became a producer. It became much more faster and much more telling, much more telling from many, many producers you, me, everyone in 25, they produce every day 150 pieces of news new every day. While classic media used to work very hard, sit in air condition, write good scripts, and produce one piece. So 25 is a mix between classic media and social media. It's the media which people want to see. It's also not fancy. We didn't build one set. We didn't pay one penny on doing a good furniture and good, good coloring and good uh, designs. We use nature, we use life. We, we get singers, we make them sit on the bank of the night and sing. It's the best setup you can ever get in your life. And it's also closer to people. Because people, where in the world do you see this fancy setup of TV station? With fantastic colors and lighting. Where, where in our world did this happen? We, we coming back to the world and we coming back to the young people who can express about the world 
much better and much faster and much more productive and productive and much more informative than classic media. Everything is interactive. If broadcasters and television people think they're gonna work by themselves any longer, they are wrong. There is no chance to sit in, in a fancy desk and write scripts about what's happening in the street. People in the street are much more capable to tell you about themselves. They have in the tube 24 hour new ideas, new, new movies, social media, what they have in their mind, what they think about. So everything of that is, um, is, is coming to 25. And this is how, as much as the Egyptian revolution will change the world, 25 will change the media of the world. They can, we shut it down before and we resume it. We're, 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 we've been there, we're professional, we know how to do technical things that it's, it doesn't matter if they shut the channel, but the idea reached the people and there is many audience now know that we are telling the truth and we're not twisting facts. So our main power now comes from the people, not from shutting the channel. The last time we, they came to us and that shut the channel, I shut it because we couldn't work. I mean, destroy, they destroyed the place and I, I couldn't work for one week. But uh, there was a call in every audience of us to come back to the screen and this is why we came back. So uh, even, even cutting down the channel now physically is not gonna stop the idea, is not gonna stop the innovation. You know, innovation will go. If, if they cut the satellite, we'll do it online. It, because nobody can really cut a method of, of communication. Because everybody's communicating now. If, if they shut all over the channel, we'll do it on YouTube. It's all coming closer and closer. I mean, people used to watch only here in the Middle East, they only watch to uh, satellite, but it's another lesson we got from the revolution. All the communication was on social media and everything was online. So this is another lesson we got, that online is reaching. Online is a method to do it. I, I, I don't think if I'm on, on satellite or online or on radio, it's all ways to reach and to get the idea. What I think of, my, and my real competition is like, if you look to my picture, you don't go to the fridge and pick up a Coca-Cola. <laughs> I don't give you a chance to do that. This is what I have in mind. Yeah, look, look at me and you will stare. You keep looking at me. You will not have time to look to and get a beer from the fridge. All the money I make from ORF, I put in the channel. But I have, the business model is clear. I'm betting on a brand which became one of the most famous and most, most appreciated brands, which is the young Egyptian way of thinking and revolution. This is a brand that nobody is selling. It will take time, but I am sure we'll get advertisers at the end. The Egyptian Young Revolution is launched and it's reaching, it's reaching you in Vienna, it's reach, reaching in front of the stock market in New York, it's reaching everywhere. The Egyptian Revolution in its orbit and no one, even military, can take it down. No one can take it down. The military will have to come to the rules. It may be a tough road because the belief Whoever group believe on using force is gonna lose. And as far as we see now until today, that the military is using force to get out of their problems. This is not acceptable and the international world will not acceptable. Challenging uh, problems, getting over it, get, if over it will only be solved by the people and the young people not by force. So whoever sector will think that force 
will be a solution for problems he's going to lose at the end. And the first losers will be the military rulers. Uh, military will have to give power to civil group. Of course, they will, I, I can't say when, but the more they use force to get over the problem, the more I'm quite sure that their end is coming closer. You know, as I told you, I've been 40 years in this business. I, I don't feel fear. I fear about the others. I fear about the young people who go in the square every day and face challenge and face this. Uh, when it comes to me, you know, I am there. You know, I, I know that after 40 years in the business, uh, nobody can really uh, get, get, get to your level, even if they killed you, even if they kill you. You know, it doesn't really matter. What matters is the ideas and the principle you raise. You never think like, is, is your own body going to be uh, the obstacle and the reach? It's, I, I don't think individually now. I think of my, the young people whom I'm learning from them. As long as I'm learning, I'm alive and I don't feel anything threatening me. I learn from the young people how they think for the future and how they express about this themselves and how they have the power not to twist facts. And as long as I'm learning this, I think I have a strong uh, reason to stay. That communication and ideas and young people says go directly to people without barriers. My idea for Egypt that they let the Egyptians solve themselves, their problems. This is my idea to Egypt, to admit that Egyptians are capable to solve their own ideas, especially young people and poor people and isolated people. If they're given that chance, they will solve their problems, and this is my hopes for Egypt. Please join me. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind invitation. I'm honored to be here. Of course, a lot of that I was wrong. <laughs> when I see it now, this was recorded 2011. It was about the TV station I launched, as Peter described it very shortly. We'll come to this at the end. But being wrong, is the one thing Middle Easterns are not used to admit. <laughs> and keeping the static quo is the dilemma of the Middle East. Everyone wants to keep things as it is. Wealthy people want to stay wealthy. Occupying territories, no one will leave an inch of it. Any ruler come to power, he wants to stay f until his last breath. So existing permitted coup is even against God's will, because God's let us die. It's a proof that he wants the new, and he wants the coming generation. But anyway, I'm coming here today for a different topic. We all, I'm sure, shocked and, and disguised by the aggression against our culture by uh, terrorists and fundamentalists. We hear about this blow up of uh, temples everywhere, cutting the heads, using women as slaves, you know, doing kind of all what we want to have as a principle and culture we live upon. They want to destroy our culture mainly. 
which we spend years and a few years of building it, and we're ready to protect it. You probably, you probably studying art or having a job from nine to 11, you probably don't even watch the American news anymore because confused and the government is we, uh, ruling us now is not easy to understand. We don't have an accurate line or uh, a, a, a target where we're going. And we think it's not in our business or we can keep it in our back and ignore it a little bit. But I'm here to tell you that the real fight and the real battle is targeting each one of them, each one of us. And each one of us has the capability and has the power to stop it. If we leave it only to military or to armies or to government, I'm sure the fight will take much longer than we think. If, if each one of us as a culture and art practitioner did not start and set his mind now, set his mind as if we are sitting now about the final target and what we will do, life will be more difficult as we go. We're not here to discuss if is Islam is good or bad. Because Islam is good. We have 1.7, uh, 1.3 billion Muslims around the world. If you calculate how much terrorism percentage of them, it will be maybe least than any other sect anywhere else in the world. But does, th this does not mean that Muslims insist not to revise. As I said, keeping the status quo is not good. And living in the culture and leaving the message, the main message of Islam with Muhammad broke the political message of, of going into peace and insist on copying him in every details of his culture, which was made thousands of years ago this is the real threat we're facing. They insist on do Muhammad's detail on everything. While they forgot about a lot of things, uh, uh, he, advise, he, he advises. So what do terrorists want? Terrorists want to destroy our culture mainly. And they hungry for blood. And they want to make us live back in the thousands of years culture. This is what mainly the terrorists want to, to, uh, to get from us. And, and we have even more of a threat. Al-Qaeda, when, when Al-Qaeda was founded, they believed that there is a Khalifa. The Khalifa, the one who followed Muhammad. But, uh, Al-Qaeda did not have a Khalifa among them. Now we have a much bigger threat with ISIS. ISIS believe the Khalifa came back. It means we obey him totally, not even think about democracy. It means we, we have to, to copy what Muhammad did by details. It means he always right and he always can tell us what to do. What made people decide we have to understand what made people decide to destroy our, our civilization and culture. We have to understand at the beginning that this part of the world live in a dilemma of no democracy dictatorship. They have mismanagement of economical and money business among them, and they live in full of corruption. Uh, I will, I'm going to tell you a short story concerning this man. I'm, I'm not going to play his video because it's a bit tough. When I was young, I used to have a, 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 a young neighbor friend of mine who went to start to go to school together in the medicine college. And this guy knows to be coming from a, a middle class family. 
and all his family was respected. His father, I think, was a, a doctor, and his mother was very well respected, and he lived a, a normal life. And one day, President Sadat of Egypt was killed at the time, 1981, and I go to the trial of the assassination of President Mubarak, and whom do I see in the first, in the cage, in the first line, was this friend of mine. And I go to him and ask him, what made you come here? He said, first thing, I had got nothing to do with this. I didn't kill Sadat, I'm not involved in this case. But the police went to my house and were looking for me and I was not there, under suspicion also. And the court afterwards released it. And he, he, he said, but when they didn't find me at home, they arrested my sister and my wife. Sorry, my sister and my mother. And what happened to them in the police station will make me revenge for the rest of my life. You know who's this guy? Does anybody recognize this face? It's Zawahiri, the leader of Al-Qaeda after Bin Laden. So this is a dictatorship I'm talking about. What made them change, uh, what did them want to change our culture and stand to it? I know as much as I, I, uh, I know Zawahiri, I had the first sip of whiskey in my life from the bottle of Bin Laden. I was a friend of his brother Khalid, who's a very decent, distinguished man, live in the suburb of Cairo, and he was my colleague in school, and we sneak one day in our early teenager, because he told me that there is something called the whiskey with my brother Bin Laden, and I go there. Muhammad Atta, the one who hit the World Trade Center, when I first see the picture on CNN with the World Trade Center hit, I run to his father's house, which was not too far from where I live. It's on the Pyramid Street in Cairo. And go to the father and tell him, what happened? Your son did that. And he looked at me and said, he was talking to me half an hour ago from a Pizza Hut place. <laughs> so those people, what made them leave Pizza Hut and the whiskey and try to destroy the entire civilization and start to chop heads? Although Muhammad, this is, this is one of the hadith, Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you know best the affairs of your worldly life. That Muhammad, the story behind it, that Muhammad, when he, uh, he was passing by some farmers doing the palm trees, pollinating the palm trees. And Muhammad never been a farmer in his life. He was a merchant all his life. So he said, what are you doing? He said, they said, we're doing this so in order for uh, the dates to come out. And he said, no, 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 don't do it. And he walked away. Three months later, he was passing by the same people. And he asked them, he found them in misery. They were weeping. They didn't make their bread and butter. All what they have was the dates. And since they didn't do this, they didn't have dates. And he said, what happened? He said, you told us not to do it. And he looked at them, and he said that. He said, even if I tell you things doesn't match your life, and doesn't, doesn't, and on another word, they thought, this is, this is when Muhammad returned back, you know, in his last days. In his early days, when he started to call for Islam, people asked him to describe the Islam for him in one word. And you know what he said? He didn't say pray, he didn't say go to Mecca, and he definitely didn't say kill people and, and slave women. You know what he say? Islam, in Arabic it come in one word, but in English I have to say it in two words. It's how to deal with each other. That's the Islam we should understand. How to deal to each other. We mean to be good to each other. Okay. Yeah, but going back and say Islam said that and didn't say that will not help us. 
I now understand that Islam, but what Muslims are doing and how do we behave through that? Either the minority of them or ma the majority of them. But I was also taught when I was young, I, I start to take security lessons. So the first thing, they tell you one of the first thing, if a guy attack you with a knife, you don't run and hold the bigger knife. Otherwise, both of you may be dead. What you do is take off your jacket and throw it in his face. You, you blind him. It's much faster to control him than, than going into another fight with him. In our case and in our daily life, our jacket in this case is the culture and the art you're creating. This is a, I call it the pillar of terrorism. And we should go for the pillar more than going for their bodies. Because going for the pillar will destroy the entire construction they try to build. By, but going after one body or many bodies or order bodies will never, you have to go for the mind before you go to the body. Or let whoever go to the body go after the body. But we as a practitioner, of culture and as a young generation who are looking to make our life better, we should try to destroy the pillars, which are rejection of Western culture, as I described before, justification of killing, which we see it, how it's happening all the time, defeat of globalization, which I will come back to it later. You have to have a desire to win. Now we understand what they after, and we, 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 we frame it all into culture ideas. Now we have to have hope. We start by hope. We give ourselves the hope that we're going to win at the end. No matter how much killing and war and bombarding, the hope will, will let us see in front of us. Plan, your plan should know what's human rights and how much you should respect it. The freedom, fundamental freedom, you should all get to know what's democracy and how we implement it into people and we how we can adapt to this and make it available for the others. Face, eliminate limitation and create more mindset. I have one good professor, Yuval Harari, which made a very nice story. He said, our, what makes the difference between our civilization and animals civilization? It's not like material things we found around us. It's it's not, we're not sophisticated and civilized because we have a bigger car or even a faster train. But we, because we have hypothetical idea and our capacity to cooperate around it. The, anim, the ants can cooperate. You see them going in line, going to their food, and they 100% cooperating. But they don't have hypothetical idea. They don't have imagination. We built imagination, and we are ready to help ourselves to develop it. This is how we may, if you ask, if you ask a monkey, if you give a monkey a dollar and ask him to give you the banana he's holding in his hand, he will never give it to you. But you go with this dollar to the supermarket, and you can buy the banana. This is a system which did not exist in reality. It's not materialistic. It's all culture we built, built on imagination and built on vision. The money business which allow us to get the food instead of go hunting or pick the tree. And every hypothetical system and every dream we lived, we are ready to help each other against it to develop it. And this what makes us humans. And in our case, we have to have the idea and the face that we're going to stop terrorism, racism, 
we're going to praise democracy, we're going to insist on the freedom. You know, you said, I'm just a culture maker. I'm getting away. I'm, I'm worried about my daily life. I, I will go show you some pictures and I'll prove that one man, maybe as young as you are, most of you here, with one picture, one photograph, changed the world. And this is the first proof. This picture of the drowned young bo Syrian boy on the Turkish shore changed the entire world of how do they look into refugees, Syrian refugees' story. A country like G Germany was closing its border totally in, in the face of refugees, accepted so far 85 million Syrian. This is another picture we all remember. Change the world. Uh, the guy who stopped the tanks in, uh, in the Chinese square. We all know this picture. Another picture, and I have a personal relation with the photographer who, who took it. This is, a, this is a South Vietnamese police policeman killing a Vietnamese in um, North Vietnamese, uh, the communist Vietnamese in the street. The photographer name was a great guy of Time magazine. His name was Eddie Adams. Eddie, you can find out his picture, great picture. But this picture stopped the war in Vietnam. It raised an international public opinion against the war. And Eddie told me that this guy walked to him after killing the other guy and he told him, he saw the pity in the photographer picture. I, he took only one frame in the right moment before the bullet, he could have taken another frame when his head is, but will not leave the same, the same effect if you see a, a blown head. You see this picture and you know this has to stop. We want to stop this. And he, the South policeman walked to him and he said, he deserved that. He killed many of my people and yours too. And he walked away. Eddie told me that he was never convinced of that. And this is what shows in his picture. I knew later on that Eddie was coming to Cairo. I was at the time working for the President, President Mubarak in his media office, a cameraman and a producer. It was like a big shot. But I know Eddie was coming. So I, I decided to receive him in Cairo airport. And I went to him and I introduced myself that I'm a student. I was in my very early 20, maybe. 20 or 21. I said, I'm a student and I want to be your assistant when you shoot picture for a while. And he said, okay, meet me tomorrow morning on front of the Nile Hilton in Cairo. I said, okay, early morning, I shower, I, I put my best t-shirt and my silk or whatever. I put my jeans at the time of Charleston, you know, the big, <laughs> and and I go and meet, meet him in the morning. He came down from the hotel, and the first thing he looked at me, he said, you're not coming with me. And I said, why? He said, you look too elegant. You don't look like the rest. You're a, you're a culture maker. You should not get yourself above the people by any chance. You don't put yourself on the story. You are only the eyes and the ears of the people. And as much as you look like the ground you walk in, as much as you succeed in your mission, don't get above people and don't get above the action and the sceneries you see. Be one of them. And then a few weeks later, we were doing the first story on the Islamic power. So we went to Saudi Arabia. And early morning before sunset, they took us to an air base for the first two Saudi pilots who were flying jets. And the sun was coming up, red and very big. And far off, I saw a little mos mosque and minaret while the pilots were already in the sky. 
doing acrobats for us. Show us how good they are. And I went to Eddie and I said, Eddie, you know what? It will be a fantastic, lovely shot if we can get these pilots to dive all the way until the minarets. So the two aeroplanes will go through the minarets and the sunrise on its back with its red color, it will be a fantastic shot. He said, Mohammed, this is very, very good thinking. But another mistake you did. I said, what? He said, you're telling me this? I'm the last person who can do what you want. <laughs> so you should, if you have a good idea, you should see who can help you in doing it. Go to the right person to do it. Put it on the right channel. And this is another advice I lived on all my life. When you, ha when you have something you want to do, ask the right people for it and go through the ch right channels to it. If you want to combat racism and fundam fundamentalism, see who else can help you with that. See, don't go to the website where they uh, recall people to go and fight there, but go for the one who would help you in doing that. Uh, Eddie passed away, I think, uh, 2006. This is another picture. Maybe n didn't change anything of the world, but it's it changed me forever. I volunteered in 1973. Before that, all what my dreams was about to work on the movie. And when I knew that there is a war between Israel and Egypt in 1973, I volunteered in the war. And then after a few days, you know that in this war, the Egyptian army crossed to the other side, occupied side of the Suez Canal, which was Israeli army occupying it from 67 until we had the peace treaty and the, they withdraw in 1978. So in 73, I go there and they took me, they said, we're gonna take you to the other side of the canal and we want you to film a scene there. They didn't tell me what it is. So as I pass, I found soldiers, which I thought at the beginning, they all Egyptian soldiers. But I notice after a while that some soldiers are in the hands of other soldiers, prisoners. Before seeing this scene, we used to be taught in schools that Isra Israelis are not exist. They're gonna be all thrown, you know, Egypt and Israel start to fight from 48 until 73. They went three fights. And we were not allowed to read any books about Israel. We, 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 had, we, we did not even know where Israel exactly because we do, didn't see a map of it. All what was allowed to say when they mention Israel, they have to say before it, the enemies. They don't say Israel. The word Israel was not in our dictionary. The word enemy, our enemy, no, it's Israel, but you guess <laughs> it's Israel. And then they were not even human beings. So no, when, I, when I went, they asked me to film this. I found many of them injured. They were like 53, or exactly 53. Many of them were bleeding and injured. So I refused. I said, no, I can't film bleeding people. If you want to film prisoners, I want only the ones who are not wounded or injured. And I end up with 12. So I landed up like this. But from this moment, I learned that I was shocked that Jews are humans like us. <laughs> and this, since then, I decided to start my company, Video Cairo, under one code and flag. Tell the truth and bridge gaps and try to build peace. Don't wait for them just to tell you what they want to listen, but bring the truth and give it to the rest of the world. 
gain experience. Because gaining is the only, only way to, to keep going on life. If one day pass without getting a new information, oh, thanks God now to, the, to this, that information are around this 24 hour. It wasn't as difficult as on my time before because every, every truth you were looking for, you have to spend an effort. Now you don't have to spend too much effort in order to get knowledge. And continue educating yourself. Learn how to build peace. Peace is built through layers. First of all, see the common ground between the two fighting parties. The minimum one will be in common of humanity. You're a human being and he's a human being. And think about his security, your, op your opposite security, even if you keep a little bit of it, if you show that you care for his security or the security of sons and daughters a little bit, there is a big chance that negotiation will be the way to solve your problem. Respecting human rights, imagination I told you about, imagination which built our civilization. In our case, visualizing things like human development or justice is more difficult than just taking a picture of a car. So you have to set your mind up of how you visualize these things because it, it takes more effort and strength. St coordinating between people, I, I showed you the picture of the war prisoners. You know, the eye contact I got there from the prisoner made me believe in coordination between people is the way. Uh, that's why I was in support of Sadat when he started the peace initiative with Israel because he, all his idea was based on this. Let's shake hand with the one who were, were considered the enemy. So in our fundamentalist cases, I'm not justifying anything, but at least the war we launched against ISIS with 32 different countries, now Russia and everyone is joining it. Uh, no one tell us when ISIS will come up with the white flag, whom they gonna go to? I mean, we have to have an end for every war. And the culture maker's job is to make an introduction for this end. Because no matter how much the war will last, even if it lasts for ages, at the end there will come peace. And our role is start putting the seats for peace now. Mm, this is another video. I show how you can be creative and how can you imagine things in order to go to through one of the most political sensitive issues I attend in my life. This is in Camp David Accords, the Camp David after the 73 war, Sadat and Begin started negotiation, guarded and uh, hosted by President Carter in Camp David here in the States. And the main ask for Sadat was with withdrawal from the land which are occupied by the Israeli army in 1967. By the way, it's the only, this agreement, Camp David Agreement, is the only respected, lasted agreement in the Middle East for more than 35 years now. And because of signing this agreement, the Israeli army for the first time uh, withdrew from occupied land. But the negotiation, negotiation was about to collapse totally. And uh, because Begin refused to withdraw from all the land. He wanted to withdraw from some of the land. You know, the usual political 
games. And President Sadat asked everyone of his team to pack his clothes and go. Carter and his people came up to idea and went to Sadat and they told him, you know, Prime Minister Begin, we know him, he's a very emotional guy. He has three granddaughters. So if we, if we get you the pictures of the three granddaughters and their name, what would you write as a delegation for them in order for Prime Minister to take it back to his granddaughter when he go back? And Sadat wrote that he wished them all peace and prosperity, and he mentioned everyone's names. At the time, bring the picture was taking time, not like today you posted on the email. So they got the picture, and he signed it, and he wrote this. This will be shown in full. Peter will, will run this film on another day. It's called I The Price of Peace. This is just the trail, but the whole film, I think, Peter, you're going to run it. You're agent for the Israelis, or whether he's a double agent? Uh, you and the situation, it changed it totally. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. A bigger loss for me than almost anything that ever happened in my own personal family. So that, of course, unfortunately was killed because of his, his signature. Select what you want. We talk about human rights, democracy, how to build peace, how to empower women, how to support minorities. You have to select, you, you can't be doing everything. In your culture work, is Mr. Fauzi here? Hi, Mr. Fauzi. <laughs> Sir Fauzi, a spokesman for the UN for many years, and a great media person I respect. So you choose the topic you want to do and make a plan how you're going to do it and, and never give up on. We go back to 25 TV, which you start with. You know the Egyptian young people gather in Tahrir Square to uh, to de demonstrate for taking Mubarak down, who was lasting and ruling Egypt for more than 30 years. After 18 days, he stepped down. The people in Tahrir Square used social media for coordination, where to go and what to do. And they upload on social media the culture which helped on getting their goal based on idea of three pillars, freedom, democracy, and social equalities. There was no political agenda, and no one of them knew how to run a political system before, because Mubarak did not allow this during his time. So, but, but the culture was the most effective thing happening, which forced Mubarak to step down at the end. So I, I wanted to use those young people that they use the social media or go physically to the, to the Tahrir Square to sing or to draw a cartoon or to design a flag and make people walk under the flag or not design nice t-shirts with good slogans calling for democracy. I wanted to do, I wanted to keep this social media effort lasting. Because majority of Egyptians, they illiterate and they watch TV more than they go on the computer. So I, I, I launched 25 TV from Tahrir Square. I collect a group of people not more than you are. And most of them were young people, average age, and I give them a very short course of how to do the television business, either a producer or a cameraman or a technician or a presenter or a reporter. About 52 we start with, and we launched the channel from Tahrir Square. We didn't spend much money. It was 
it was something in, in the middle between classic broadcasting and social media. And I think this is what all the future broadcasting will go through because they can't stay still by themselves sitting in the air-conditioned room, as I said before in the interview, and writing good scripts. Because everyone has a phone now, become a producer. The, the thing with 25 was to collect all these people and put them on the right th track of how can they be watched through the satellite world, Arab worldwide. And I depend very much on the profession more than media st uh, studies. I mean, I go to a doctor who built himself a small hospital tent in Tahrir Square, and I let him introduce a program about security in, in, in the square. I go to, uh, to a guy who came to me one time. He's, he has a very famous icon picture of the Egyptian revolution when the police forces stand in front of them and raise the flag. While he was raising the flag, a policeman shot him in the eye. So instead of falling on the ground, he, turned, he had a camera and he turned a video camera to his eye. And he get me the picture and he ran to the hospital. The, he filmed in the hospital how bad they were treating him. And he come to me with 15 minute video about how he was shot in the eye. I made this picture for him and I trained him to be a presenter. He presented a, pro a program called What Peoples Want. He go every day and record wherever he found about what people want, and what they're demonstrating about, and in authentic this with the authority of if is it possible to be done or not. And it was a very popular program. It's called People's Want. And this lady. She's a typical poor middle class mother of two girls who decided to cook in Tahrir Square. She had a very little budget and she was doing her best to feed maximum number of people in Tahrir Square with the little budget she has. So with something like four dollars, she would feed in Tahrir Square at least 25 people. And I go and, and see how come you do that? And she sat down, she, she write to me the recipes of the old time my grandmother used to do, mainly using rice or vegetables, very basic element, but very nice and old Egyptian cooking, which is great. And she also has a spirit and she has the natural folkloric wisdom and she's very talented. So she was presenting the cooking show, which she became number one popular in not only in Egypt, the entire Arab world. And through the program, it was a cooking show, but we were delivering all the messages I talk about in my entire talk tonight. All the good messages from empowering the woman because she became a star and she, she's not shy of her background. She used to say, I'm a maid, but now I'm a star. Uh, empowering woman make believe that the people has to have the initiative to get over their problems and obstacles from praising the good social life, even putting a call for democracy. She had millions when she was running the story, but unfortunately we stopped the program. We even stopped it online after the online was hacked. She's been off off the screen for more than a year and a half now, she still have 165,000 followers. After one and a half year of not being there, but she was the most popular one. The last video we're gonna see is very uh, interesting and, and showing how can we build a relation between bridge gaps of culture between the West and the East. It's the last production I did before I left Cairo before I leave the Middle East and Egypt. And it was done from A to Z by a partnership between 
American team and international team and the Egyptian team. And it was looking for the Egyptian culture, looking for the antiquities of the Egyptian culture. It's called uh, Chasing Mummies. And it was shown, showed both in Egypt and in, uh, in History Channel here in America at the same time. It's again from forming the team who will film it was there was 30 American and, and 30 Egyptian American and different nationalities from Europe on all the level from the technical team to the presenter and the stories about one Egyptologist, very famous guy, Zai Hawass, who take four trainees with him and go and try to, to make new discoveries under the water of the Mediterranean or in the Valley of the Kings in, uh, in Luxor. We're going to show a little bit of it. And again, Peter will have the full, because this is 10 hours of production. We run the whole entire series on a different time. But this is again how we conflict of culture between the two parties, permission, no permission, security, no security. One Russian woman wants to find Cleopatra's tomb, and we go on all the time. But it's very interesting and attractive, and still built the trust between people and the idea of globalization is definitely there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay here, please. Uh, we're going to take some questions uh, from the audience. I, I think a lot of subjects were touched upon tonight, and uh, we'd love to hear back from uh, from you folks. So uh, any questions for Gohar? My name is Michael Gangelou, Um And I was wondering how you communicate with uh, people like, you know, terrorists um, who just just are, you know, willing to go for violence and like to any means necessary and are just like almost unreachable. So do you think, do you have faith like in all people? Do you think there's a way like is your kind of goal for peace to find still some common ground even among the people that are just totally uh, just in the direction of violence, you know, like Al-Qaeda and all no this No justification people. for violence. Yeah, but do you think that there, my question is, do you think there's like, um, uh, when you think of a solution for their, their like finding peace and a common ground, do you think that involves, like, do you think there's, do you have we faith have in them as people? We have to you know? consider negotiation as part of solving the problem yeah. With, with the terrorist, even with terrorist. Mm -hmm. So you think there, you have faith in them? You think there is a way? We, you yeah. have to make in your mind if there is, if they are terrorists, the more they can negotiate. You start from day one of the battle, mm -hmm. building among the, the people they live with them another team who can take because, you know, uh, ISIS rule a country bigger than um, Britain. So there is people there. It, the, 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 I'm not saying negotiate with terrorists, because terrorists is, is not justified by any chance. But there is people around them. As I explained, they live under circumstances. Try to lift these circumstances. Try to give the respect to human rights among those people. So in after, after after a while, you will have someone to talk with. But negotiation is a, is a must, even of how to conquer terrorism. Thank you. Like this, Mr. Ahmed. This was Ahmed doing all his life in the UN, building negotiation and respecting how to build peace.
thank you for your time and for speaking. Um, I just wanted to ask, you being involved in the political affairs of the Iraq and that area and the way you are and seeing all the gruesome things that you've seen, how is it that you maintain such a positive outlook and sort of think that everything can be solved and peace is um, inevitable? How do you keep that outlook? Mm, I, this is exactly why I, uh, I got the film which you're going to watch tonight because it's made in 68. An era which there was no ISIS, and I believe that we can get back to this era. I believe no matter, as I said, as, as long as the war time between people and hostile life goes, as long as it goes, if you measure it within uh, the lifetime time of humanity, it's much way shorter than peaceful time. And as I said before, our role is to bath the road for the peace who will definitely come. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, wait. Wait. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My question was, how did you manage to be successful financially, but still at the same time do the projects that you believed in? As a person that works in a different realm, sometimes I struggle with commercial work versus projects that I really like that don't necessarily make me any money. She's my daughter. She's worried about <laughs> Well, I can't say I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying my best. And if it comes, it comes. I, I lost all the money in 25, a humongous amount of money in 25 TV, and I did it because I believe that it was, it was safe for the Middle East. It was the blue ocean who were talking to people no one was talking to before. So I, I didn't really did, the, as I said before, half of what I said in the first interview. Now I'm, I'm, I'm going back on it. I, I said there that the army, if the, if the army uses the power, he will not succeed. We see it now, they succeed, unfortunately. But would this last? I don't believe so. I, I, didn't, take, I, I didn't take one single advertisement because it was a, a bad time, because they threw an accusation to you. If you go and take even an ad from Coca-Cola, they think you're an American agent. They put many, many civil societies and, uh, and uh, organization under uh, siege. They closed down many non-governmental business. But it's, uh, as I said in the interview, the Egyptian revolution ideas are there. The, 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 um, how to take it to the people was the role of 25 TV and, and this is why I was giving up for a while, hoping that in the future I will recover in the economical uh, base I did. Would this answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> you have to do what you do and what you believe in first. And believe me, I started, when I started, I had nothing. I was just a cameraman by myself and I was a volunteer. I take chances and I do what I believe in. And believe me, money comes. Anyone else? Um, so my biggest question with the media <laughs> um, today is there's so much involved in uh, like CNN or the New York Times, they have backers, they have to sell advertising. How, how are you finding your model in this world where you, you, you can't always tell the truth because the truth might hurt someone that's funding the thing that you're doing? Um, and it creates this sea of, of mistrust and misinformation that 
you know, sometimes we, 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 we get caught with, you know, like, and I, I find this like very interesting and, and, and innovative and, and revolutionary, like Channel 25. And at the same time, what happens when you come to that point where you, you have to take into consideration the interests of those that fund you? First of all, the team I choose, I said, were all young people. So the, 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 the business in the Middle East are manipulated by the petrodollar, the business of broadcasting and media. It's all manipulated by petrodollar, from advertising to direct support to everything, almost even, even local government station like TV of Egypt or TV uh, of Yemen is supported by Saudi money. And they all, before, uh, just, just now because of what ISIS is doing, you know, you know, nothing is so, too bad in this life. ISIS showed us the need for to come up with a different media. Before ISIS and before the Egyptian revolution, one time I was sitting in Egypt and counting how many fundamentalist religion channel launched in the local Nile set, and there were six, 16 of them. They all financed by Arab countries. But credibility gets you money. Credibility. If people believe you, you will start to have more audience. And if you have more audience, you can sell your shoes in Brazil. The TV country will launch in Egypt with credibility. If a factory of shoes, you want to sell it in Brazil, you can sell it in Brazil. If you don't have credibility, if, if you are bad governance, you can't make money. So credibility, get the money at the end. But it's, it's going to take a long way for the Middle East. Now ISIS sh showed us the need for, for secular media to be presented. Everyone knows now that uh, a reform of Islam and a secular media has to be presented in the middle of, of, uh, to the Middle Eastern people, thanks to ISIS for that. Before that, they were all asleep on what's happening in the media when it was all supported by Wahhabi ideas and uh, uh, fundamentalist religion programs. Other questions? Yes. Maybe that uh, last one. Uh, in the initial video that you showed, you said that Channel 25 would be bringing truth without twisting or distorting the facts. Now, a couple of days ago, MSNBC reports that a man charged towards the Damascus Gate and was shot down by Israelis. Fox News then retaliates and says, well, we have to mention that he was armed and was Palestinian. So if you were to talk to Rupert Murdoch or Ted Turner at CNN or the heads of MSNBC, how would you tell them to properly report on this conflict in a way that isn't biased or that isn't twisting the facts, that's purely the truth? Well, I, I never stop working for Merduk or any other channel. Tomorrow I'm going uh, to, uh, to Fox to give an interview. I was always the Middle East production house for all these American companies. And uh, our role is to stop where the fact is. We were fast, a lot of times we were live, we, you don't give them much time to, uh, to m m manipulate or use the story on their uh, political agenda. Once you're professional enough, you know how, or choose the right people to do it, like how I choose 25 TV. 20 f I'm ready to start here now with you guys, so ch ch start a channel and put it online, and, and, and I, I'm 100% sure that within one or two months, we'll be getting lots and lots of advertising. So being professional and stand for what the business is standing for is all what you care about. After this, if they take it, I have uh, another 
first story I tell you that when uh, a CNN cor correspondent, his name was Weedman, he was covering some fights between again the Palestinians and the Israelis, and he was standing in the Palestinian side. So the Israeli police shot at him. So he went to Palestinian hospital for treatment since he was on the Palestinian side. And he started to say, because everyone was shooting against each other, he was, he come on television and he, he was uh, reporting that he was shot by Israeli soldiers. And he told me that the vice president of CNN called him up and he said, you don't have to because you're not very sure. Don't keep coming to television and say Israeli soldier shot you because we're not 100% sure. So the, there is commercial sides, but not from the professional people you trust and give them the word. I have a question. Who are the professional people that you trust today? Every, what are the sources that you everyone trust? would follow what I said from the beginning. The, the, the people I collect from Tahrir Square to do the 25 TV channel, I, where I got them from, from social media. I was watching their short interviews while they were in Tahrir Square, or their singing, or their jokes. And I look for this guy and look and found him. And then give him the basics. I never censor any of their work. Like a big story in the Middle East, how to cover the peace process. We used to call how to cover anyone, just to report a story from, from Israel is a normalizer. So I put the reporters of the news and I give them three or four questions. Said, do you care for peace built between the Arab world and Israel? And he say, yes. So do you think if you, if you re start your report by saying, the Israeli enemy or just Israel? What will help in building the ultimate purpose you want to reach, which is peace between Israel? Mentioning that they are the enemies or without mentioning? And he said, without mentioning. And he said, okay, this is all what I want, just to be non-biased. Non-biased, make your credibility gets better and that's it it was not and many many things of fundamentalism all what i talk about in covering fundamentalism and building bridges like we were uh, emphasizing on the news of how how much of respect of human rights everywhere and instead the other media they always talk about conflict and you know you know they when it comes to America, it's the one-sided idea or the double standing they have. So we look for common things and, and be credible and have a mindset and have a target and choose a way and never give up. Please. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, two questions. One is, um, the film that you uh, made in 1973 of the Israeli uh, prisoners of war, yeah. was it a short film or long film? What did it contain? That's Actually, it was, I was only filming the prisoner and this film, I didn't even go into details, but changed, changed my life totally after this because it, w it lasted only, I had a Bill and Howell camera, which I, I'm still holding in the house which has a roll of film, it takes only three minutes of film. I film two and a half minutes, and then an Israeli air raid came above us. So we threw ourselves in the ditch. And I took this two minutes and a half film, and I sent it to the Egyptian soldier intelligence who were always accompanying me. And they sent, I, I saw it at night, on Egypt TV, it was run in Egypt TV. And it was the first time they see Israelis humans in Egypt TV. And President Sadat was still in the operation room. He also saw the film. And he ordered a jet. At the time, there was no satellite to send the film with. So he ordered a jet to take the film 
and talk to King Hussein of Jordan to play the film in Jordan. At, until the sixth day of the war, Israel was denying that the Egyptian army crossed to the other side. And they were saying, just to wait a minute, we're going we're gonna to defeat the, arm, the Egyptian army as we defeated them previously. So they run the film on the terrestrial, terrestrial channel of Jordan TV and Israeli mothers and fathers watch their son for the first time captured. In the, and this is how I got the job to work for uh, Sadat. His office secretary called me next morning and he said, come and work for Sadat. Yeah. You know, I, I recall how that film changed the perception in the Middle East at that yes. time. So that, that film is legendary. Yeah. Um, the second question that I have is, uh, what is your, you know, um, in, uh, just to take the lead from Peter here, what do you think about, in terms of reliability, what do you think about Al Jazeera? Al J I'm one of the founders of Al Jazeera, and I was in their board until 9-11. We were all hoping that Al Jazeera would report the news and the truth. And this is how I got to help them at the, at the beginning. And then I found out they were promoting the Islamic news. They care about, they care very much and cover very much if Muslims is attacked by non-Muslim. But when the opposite happen, they don't care. There is nothing in the news called Islamic news or Christian news. News is news. <laughs> and then you believe you have to be, uh, not to be obvious on showing him as much as the Gezira did. So when, on 9-11, I opened Al Jazeera, and I found them doing two stories. One saying that the Egyptian people are happy. In Egypt, if you walk in any street with a camera, kids will jump on front of you. And, and especially if you threw candy to them, they will, and they were showing the kids and saying that all Egyptians are happy of what happened in 9-11. And in the same time, they use Bin Laden picture, which I introduced into the, I introduced Bin Laden to Al Jazeera, as much as I introduced him to ABC and CBS. Because I felt way back that this guy is going to be dangerous later on. But anyway, they show Bin Laden as a, as a what do you call it, logo between the programs in, in the horseback in a slow motion, like a hero, like uh, Robin Hood. <laughs> so I called the director of Al Jazeera, Mr. Abdullah, why are you doing this? This is, this is a human tragedy. This is a, an insane attack against humanity. Why you make this guy a hero? And I resigned since then. So Al Jazeera started as we hope that it's, it's, a, it's a channel which are promoting the truth and being non-biased on exposing things, but they end up, unfortunately, not like that. We can take one more question. Anyone? I hope it's not how do we solve the Middle East problem between Palestinians and Arabs. No, not, not at all. Uh, it's more so about how, in your presentation, it was about how to hopefully end terrorism. And it included sharing amount like of mindset or perspective. Yeah. And I'm sure it could be picked up that we need to share perspective with them. But in ideal of negotiating with terrorism, would you also agree that it takes a amount of understanding of perspective over here to try and understand the situation over there? I'm not saying, I didn't say ever negotiate with terrorists. I said terrorist, terrorism is not ev even explained. I'm not saying that. Um, what I'm saying is don't start a war before you know how to end it. Our ultimate war against terrorism now is to destroy them all. We don't hear anything less than this. And there is no way to do this. It's just not logic. If you kill every single one of, if you kill all the 14 million Iraqis in Iraq, they still be fundamentalists because it's a mind thought. 
It's not only bodies and people holding knives. So we have, when, when Sadat did the 73 war, he's, he's the one I learned from. From day one, he put conditions for when he's going to negotiate. As I said, when they come out of the ditch with the white flag and say, OK, we had it. We've been beaten enough. We've been destroyed enough. Whom we going to talk with? This is what I mean. But I, I didn't ever mean that we negotiate with the Khalifa of Allah, because there is no way to negotiate with Khalifa. Thank you very much. Thank you.